Me ja istat nikoš? No. No. Petru, ti perimenume? Peri, mi milas, te spun. Your eminences, your graces, reverend fathers, beloved uh, students of uh, ours in the Orthodox Ecumenical Theology Master Program of the International Hellenic University, Ladies and gentlemen, Christ is risen. Today Please. it is a great pleasure that uh, we will finish a series of uh, open public lectures devoted to the Oriental Orthodox uh, uh, family. Uh, this is the last one. We had um, the previous two by Professor uh, Moschos on the historical perspective in dealing with the church history. Um, then uh, uh, last uh, Tuesday, it was uh, Dr. Nikos Kuremenos about uh, an interesting issue, introducing actually the Oriental Orthodox churches and beyond. And today we have uh, the pleasure to uh, be um, replacing actually Father K.M. George, who has not succeeded in uh, joining uh, so far. Probably uh, there may be some reasons for this. Uh, we all know and we pray that uh, the difficult situation in India because of the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic uh, may have uh, created some problems. We hope that he will join us later. It would be a great uh, pleasure for me at least uh, to to be with him uh, uh, as well as uh, with uh, uh, Jorgos Marcellos, my colleague from my youth. Uh, we have taught for many years in the same university and we are now also teaching at the International Hellenic University. In addition to this, uh, um, uh, Professor Jorgos Marcellos is also directing the postgraduate program of theological studies of the University of Neapolis of Cyprus in Paphos. And uh, he studied theology, history, and philosophy at the universities of Thessaloniki, Athens, and Heidelberg. He holds uh, a PhD degree from the Department of Theology of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki back in 1983 with um, uh, mark of excellence and he was a lecturer, assistant professor, associate professor and professor since the time of his retirement some six years ago. He was teaching the course of history of orthodox theology and dogmatis and also he has been a visiting professor at the universities of Munich, Bern, uh, and he served as a government at uh, Mount Athos and also director of the Patriarchal Foundation of Patristic Studies in Thessaloniki. In, uh, nine, in 2008, he was elected a, a member of the International Academy of Religious uh, Science, Académie Internationale de Sciences Religieuses, seated in Brussels. He is a member of the he was a member of the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches for many years. And um, since 2013, is a member of the World Council of Churches Faith and Order Commission. He represented the Church of Greece at the 9th and 10th General Assembly of the World Council of Churches in Porto Alegre, Brazil in 2006, and in Busan, the last one, in uh, South Korea. 2013. 
Uh, Professor uh, Marcellus will uh, uh, speak uh, as you have uh, uh, read the uh, banner of this uh, lecture on problems and perspectives of the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox theological dialogue. Professor Marcellus, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Vasiliadis for your kind presentation. And uh, I will begin uh, with my lecture. One of the most comforting and promising ecclesiastical developments in recent years was the success of the theological dialogue between the Orthodox Church and the non Hasidonian churches of the East, namely the Coptic, Ethiopian, Jacobite, Syrian, Armenian, and Indian Church of Malabar, which altogether have around 60 million Christian adherents. After over uh, 1,500 years of mutual suspicion and dogmatic confrontations since the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, and despite the differences in Christological terminology and the diametrically opposing positions regarding the Chalcedonian definition, the two ecclesiastical families surprisingly came to an agreement to sign a common dogmatic document stating their shared dogmatic faith and teaching throughout the ages. It should be noted that although many gaps and difficulties remain to be sorted out in this theological dialogue before full communion can be reached between the two uh, church families, the success even captured the attention of Western theologians, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, who were amazed at such an accomplishment. The official dialogue was initiated by the Ecumenical Patriarchate at an ecclesiastical level in 1985 in Chambézy in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, and lasted until 1993. This undertaking was preceded by 15 years of unofficial contact and theological talks between the Orthodox and non Macedonians from the year 1964 to 1979, during which both groups, both church families, came acquainted and realized the proximity between their theological traditions in relation to the Christological dogma. Significant stages in the official theological dialogue include the second general session of the ecclesiastical representatives of both traditions, which took place in June of 1989 at the monastery of Anba Bishoi, in the desert of Mitria, and also the third general session, which was held in Chambézy, Geneva, in September of 1990. It was during these sessions that the common dogmatic statements, which clearly demonstrate total consensus on the essence of the Christological dogma were signed. It is significant that the success of these above agreements is not limited to Christology only, and this is very interesting, but extends to the whole faith of the one and undivided church of the first five centuries, as well as all the dogmatic teachings of the four ecumenical councils following the schism of 451. In other words, the non Macedonians now accept not only the first three ecumenical councils, which are common to both traditions, but the dogmatic teachings of the four councils that followed uh, Chalcedon, that followed uh, after the year 451 as well. Although, without recognizing them as ecumenical and equal with the first three. The third general session mentioned above 
essentially fulfilled the purpose of the theological dialogue between the two committees as far as the Christological discussion was concerned. This being the main purpose of the dialogue. There remain, however, basic practical issues which would need to be resolved in order to achieve full sacramental communion and unification between the Orthodox and the North Macedonians. Such issues include the recognition on the part of the North Macedonians of the last four ecumenical councils as holy and ecumenical, the theological question of whether or not the Orthodox tradition allows the reversal of anathemas which were issued against certain people in synods, and which authority, which ecclesiastical authority would have the power to do so, and also the measure to which pastoral economy would be implemented in matters of liturgical and ecclesiastical administration for the realization of the sacramental communion and unification between the two ecclesiastical families. Once more, the Ecumenical Patriarchate took the initiative to address these issues. A plenary session of the Mixed Theological Committee of the Dialogue was convened in Champs-Bézy in November of 1993, which after meticulous uh, considerations drafted a mutually accepted test, which included specific proposals to both groups, both families, for the lifting of the anathemas and the restoration of full communion between them. Although this document does clearly define the way in which the anathemas could be lifted, taking into account the resulting ecclesiastical consequences, and specifically addresses the pastoral and liturgical issues of sacramental unification, it fails to mention the validation of the last four ecumenical councils as a presupposition for the search after sacramental communion. Having achieved the above mentioned dogmatic agreements, the dialogue was then completely devolved from the theological committee to the level of the local churches of both sides. Besides, the signatures of ecclesiastical leaders who had taken part in the dialogue, the patriarchates of Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Romania on the side of the Orthodox and by the Coptic, uh, Jacobite, Syrian, and Syro-Malabar churches on the side of the North Macedonians, upheld the dogmatic agreements with synodal decisions. The fact that the North Macedonians approved the agreements has a special dogmatic significance since uh, with this action, they recognized all the teachings of the seven ecumenical councils and the church fathers as completely orthodox. This is a great achievement of this theological dialogue. Uh, which are the problems uh, that the theological dialogue uh, faces and uh, which are, of course, the perspectives? Despite the astonishing success of this dialogue, as far as the Christological aspects were concerned, which as mentioned above, drew the attention of Western theologians, it must be acknowledged that many obstacles still remain to be overcome before a full sacramental communion can be achieved between the two families. Although the non Hasidonians had recognized the orthodoxy of the teachings of all the ecumenical councils and church fathers as attested to by the signed declarations, uh, they had still not recognized, as I told, the last four councils, uh, four councils as ecumenical and equal uh, to the first three. This is the, the most fundamental problem that needs to be resolved before the goal of communion can be realized. 
In order to overcome these obstacles, two subcommittees have been created, one for pastoral issues and one for liturgical matters, which meet uh, from time to time, seeking out mutually acceptable solutions to the issues that arose from the success of the aforementioned dogmatic agreement. Specifically, these problems exist because of a lack of awareness regarding the successful dogmatic agreement. There are also steps that still need to be taken to guide us smoothly and certainly to full communion and unification. Regarding the issue of awareness of the proceedings, it must be mentioned that the plenary session of the Mixed Theological Committee uh, confronted this topic during the fourth General Assembly in November 1993 and decided that it was necessary for the two vice presidents of the committee to take the following actions. On the one hand, they needed to visit the primates of both church families to fully inform them of the results of the dialogue, and on the other hand, to collaborate with the two secretaries of the assembly to see to the drawing up of suitable documents that could explain the content of the dogmatic agreement, both at a scientific level and in a context uh, understandable to lay people so that any potential misunderstandings would be avoided. However, while the two vice presidents were very active in organizing the visits to the primates of both church families, very few steps were taken to create texts uh, text explaining the outcome of the theological dialogue. The, text, the texts and publications that did circulate were the result of people who took a personal interest and not due to an organized joint effort on the part of the Orthodox and North Macedonians. Besides this, these publications did not have the widespread impact that was needed to adequately and responsibly inform people regarding the outcome of the dialogue. And naturally, the lack of the proper and systematic reporting on the results, at least in Greek Orthodox milieu, led to this information. But I think not only in Greek Orthodox milieu, but also in other milieus and countries of the Orthodox. In one, uh, if one excludes paragraph eight of the second joint declaration from 1990, which needs clarification and better warning to avoid potential misinterpretations and to stop the doubts projected onto uh, it by those who object to Christological agreement, the fact remains that certain points of the dogmatic agreement that are indisputable, uh, indisputably orthodox and patristic in character were deliberately expressed in a vague manner, manner with a clear dogmatic minimalism. This was allegedly done to facilitate a meretricious dogmatic agreement and an ecclesiastical union at the expense of the Orthodox faith. There were, of course, documented responses to this highly critical and largely uh, unwarranted ass assessments. However, this created confusion in theological and uh, ecclesiastical circles regarding the accomplishments and goals of the theological dialogue. In certain instances, there were attempts to revive the past and the fathers of the church were being interpreted partially and at will in order to bring a halt to the continuation and success 
of this theological dialogue. Some consider any further continuation of the dialogue as a cause or a split in orbits. Within the context of these objections, the harmful instances, instances of orthodoxy disgracing into fanaticism were unfortunately extremely disappointing. To avoid the reoccurrence of similar deplorable instances, not only is an efficient process of informing needed, but also productive in the orthodox deliberations and dialogues within the local churches, so as to create the greatest possible convergence and consensus between the ecclesiastical representatives in dialogue and the rest of the Orthodox flock. Without the greatest possible consensus, the sought after sacramental unification of the two ecclesiastical families poses a danger of creating internal splits among the local churches, which would be the worst possible outcome. Concerning the steps that still need uh, to be taken to achieve sacramental unification between the two uh, church families, uh, besides the resolution of the liturgical matters, which uh, the appointed liturgical subcommittees have responsibility for that, uh, we have the opinion that the most fundamental obstacle that needs to be surpassed is the question of the non Macedonians accepting the last four ecumenical councils, and especially the Council of Chalcedon, which was the impetus for the schism of the first, in the first place. As was previously highlighted, the non Macedonians already fully accepted the dogmatic teaching of the last four ecumenical councils with the dogmatic agreement in, uh, included in the common declarations. However, the no Macedonians have yet to recognize these councils as ecumenical and equal with the first three. This position of theirs, especially concerning the Council of Calcedon, is due just as much to their traditional stance towards the definition of, of, uh, uh, of the Council and the Pope Leo's tone, which it approved, they, consist, they considered the definition of Leo's tone to have an historian uh, meaning in Christology due to the Diocesite word. Um, also, I, I repeat, um, it is uh, a disposition of theirs, especially concerning the Council of Cathedral, is due just as much, as much to their traditional stance towards the definition of the Council, which is as it was to the condemnation of the Council of Dioscorus of Alexandria, whom they honor as a great father of their church. Concerning the definition of Chalcedon, we must highlight the fact <coughs> that modern academic research has proved very clearly that the theological nature of the definition not only is not Nestorian, as uh, uh, the non Macedonians believed, but also is Cyrillian. Indeed, the basis of the Diocesite formula of the definition of Chalcedon has been proven outright to be not Leo's poem, but the Christology of St. Cyril of Alexandria, something which is acknowledged even by eminent Roman Catholic theologians who, as one can see, would have every reason to support the opposite opinion. Because Popleo was uh, a very uh, great pope 
uh, not only in the West, but uh, also uh, in the uh, uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic Church as a whole. Uh, consequently, it must be understood by the non Chalcedonians that based on modern theological scholarship, their reservation to accept the definition of Chalcedon is unjustifiable as long as they claim to be faithful adherents to the Christology of sincerity. Also, regarding Leo's tone, we must underline the fact that the tone was accepted the minutes of the council, but only after the fathers of Chalcedon recognized the orthodoxy and full agreement agreement of the Tom with the epistles of St. Cyril and especially with the third epistle to Nestorius after uh, the well-known intense challenges against its orthodoxy on the part of the uh, hierarch hierarchs from Eastern Illyricum in Palestine and the explanations given by the papal legates to the council of relating to the meaning of the Diophysite phrases in this tone. In this sense, all the Diophysite uh, phrases in the tone Leo uh, are, uh, according to the fathers of the council, in full agreement with the Christology of Saint Cyril and especially with his third letter to Nestorius. As a result, in this case, the reservations of the non chalcedonians concerning the acceptance of Leo's tone are not justifiable with the commonly proposed argument that its acceptance by the Fourth Ecumenical Council allegedly entails violation of the Christology of St. Cyril. In other words, the definition of Chalcedon just as much as Leo's tone were accepted by the council under the condition of their full dogmatic accordance with the Christology of St. Cyril, which means that in that aspect, the theological character of the council was absolutely in the line uh, with St. Cyril's theology. I have written a book, uh, under the title um, Genesis and uh, Sources of the Chalcedonian Definition. And I have proved that uh, more more, the uh, Chalcedonian definition is based on the Christology of St. Cyril. And uh, I would say, uh, on the Christology of his two phases. Uh, the Christology of St. Cyril, of course, has two phases. Eh? The one phase is uh, uh, related with uh, uh, the uh, with his contradiction to Nestorius, with his three uh, epistles to him. And the second phase, is related uh, with uh, the agreement, the Christological agreement with the uh, Antiochians uh, uh, the agreement of 433. Uh, the Christological wording of St. Cyril comprised for the Council of Chalcedon the highest dogmatic criteria, both for the formulation and acceptance of the definition and for the acceptance and signing of the tome by the overwhelming majority of the fathers of the council. No, reservation, no reservations about the Cyrillian character of the Chalcedonian definition and the council of Chalcedon uh, can be established scientifically based on the facts of modern historical 
theological research. Finally, regarding to the question of the condemnation of the Oscars of Alexandria at the Four Ecumenical Council, it is also clear from the minutes of the Council that Dioscorus was condemned not for dogmatic, but for canonical reasons, which are nevertheless real and incontestable. As a result, the issue of his reign statement, on which the non Macedonians insisted, can only be resolved in the context of the pastoral dispensation of the church. And as such, the responsibility for this issue lies completely in the jurisdiction of the Eastern Orthodox Church itself. The only thing which we must know from a theological perspective is that the imposed ecclesiastical punishments are first and foremost of a pastoral character with the aim of either correcting the faithful or their preservation from the danger of heresies. And as such, these punishments are valid in the history of the uh, church to the principle of economy, of dispensation of the church. Besides, in order for the church to fulfill its ecumenical calling, it cannot be captive to historical occurrences and people when the truths of her faith are not affected by those historical occurrences. The examples of the great fathers of the church who confronted issues of a similar nature show the way in which even this matter can be approached. So, based on these facts, the acceptance of the Council of Chalcedon and by extension, the next three ecumenical councils on the part of the non Macedonians should not constitute a problem for the achievement of the unification and full communion between the two church families. Uh, prospects and conclusion. Taking this brief overview of the theological dialogue between the Orthodox and non Macedonians we must emphasize in conclusion that despite the problems presented by this theological dialogue, its prospects for the realization of sacramental unification of the dialogue in church families after the achievement of the dogmatic agreement are clearly favorable. Provided that, uh, provided that dialogue for the, sake, for the sake of dialogue is avoided. And of course, also provided that they do not simply seek out a hasty and fragile uh, unification, which would lead to internal divisions and further problems than they are already seeking to solve. To achieve this goal, both sides need to take sensible and methodic steps based on the luminous examples of the great fathers of the church who overlooked all that was secondary and trivial as long as they saw that the unity of the faith was intact. The fathers should not be perceived only as canons of faith and sure criteria of orthodoxy but also as canons of pastoral prudence and ecclesiopolitical behavior in confronting similar problems of broken ecclesiastical unity. Only in this way can be properly understood the introductory phrase of the definition of Halsey. Namely, we then following the Holy Fathers, eh? We confess, etc. Uh, we following the Holy Fathers, we can understand what it means for us today that the Fathers are not only uh, canons of faith, but also canons of pastoral 
prudence, and ecclesiopolitical behavior. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor uh, Marcellus. Uh, your presentation uh, uh, gave us uh, great hope, at least, uh, at least uh, because of the uh, immobility that uh, is being uh, uh, experienced uh, with regard to this uh, uh, Eastern and Oriental Orthodox rapprochement. Unfortunately, Professor Dimitriadis can give us more uh, information. Unfortunately, the connection with India has become uh, extremely difficult, probably not only because of the, um, uh, the worsening of the situation in the pandemic, but also because of a very um, uh, not a very uh, sufficient signal, but uh, uh, we tried very hard to, to have with us uh, and uh, intervene, uh, uh, not only direct uh, the more monitor the discussion, uh, which I <laughs> can do it myself, but um, also to see him face to face. Uh, can I ask uh, Professor... Um, uh, Dimitriadis, if there is any success in our there effort is, to... Uh, there is a success. I mean, I, I, I can see him. And uh, the only thing is that he has to uh, switch on, to, uh, he has to unmute his microphone. And I mean, I saw him before. So I will ask kindly to Father George to switch on his microphone and... Okay. In that case, in that case, please interrupt uh, our uh, discussion. Okay. Uh, because uh, if uh, uh, Father George is not ready, I would I'm like here. to... Yes. Oh, you are here. Father I'm George. I'm here. Yes, uh, Petros, I'm here. Okay, then allow me also to express no. my gratitude that you have at last uh, succeeded. Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, yes. And um, uh, you have... Uh, uh, reminded me many uh, memories of uh, our common struggle okay. for uh, church unity. Now the floor is yours uh, concerning uh, your understanding of the problems and perspectives of uh, our inter-Orthodox, we can call it inter-Orthodox, uh, it may be also an intra-Orthodox, but since, that, since we are not in communion now, we can say that it is um, a, a dialogue uh, between uh, uh, churches not being in communion. However, even within our Eastern Orthodox church, churches, there, is, there are some churches that are not in communion with other churches. So, uh, despite this... Uh, canonical problems, uh, there is also our vision that we can at least not only dialogue, but also um, together um, uh, walk towards uh, uh, the visible unity. Now, the floor is yours. Um, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we do hear yes, you. Yes, I, I yes, have yes. said something before at the beginning, but let yes. me also rem remind it uh, that uh, Father Kem George is a leading personality from the uh, Oriental Orthodox uh, Church and theology, a former, uh, he's emeritus now, but a former principal of the Malankara Theological um, uh, School, the main uh, school, and uh, also he has uh, uh, taught uh, at the Ecumenical uh, Institute of Bosse together with me for just one uh, uh, graduate, graduate uh, year. But he continued uh, in many positions uh, within the World Council of Churches. Father George, now you again. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, um, I'm, I'm really very happy to be with you, uh, but I um, just uh, uh, am worried that every uh, half minute, my network is broken, um, partly because uh, there is a, a, a storm brewing, a cyclone brewing in the Arabian oh. Sea, not far, not far from my place, um, it's some kilometers away from my place. So the net is very badly affected. So I was listening to uh, Professor Marcellus, but uh, I could get only a few sentences. We lost him again. I don't know. So, yeah, it's, so I may not be able to speak uh, continuously. Uh, just a few mind. minutes. Never mind. Continue. Yeah. yeah. Go on. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, um, I am very grateful to Professor Petros Vasiliadis, my dear friend Petros, uh, for our friendship and the fellowship I enjoyed with all the uh, professors of theology in Saloniki, in Geneva, and in many other places. So we have come together as really one family, and I. I experience the, the unity of the family, although we speak of two different families. I think Professor Marcellus has very well expressed uh, the, the key points. And I uh, had occasion to learn his position, so um, which is a very positive attitude to the whole dialogue in view of the witness of the church, witness of the Orthodox tradition in the modern world. Nikos, what can we do? We lost him, and I mean, he'll, he'll be back in, in a second because I can see him here. Oh, like, okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, now, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Continue. Yes. Yeah. So we, uh, well, yeah. What I learned from our uh, predecessors, the great theologians of both traditions, is that the unofficial dialogue, which started in Aarhus, Denmark, in nineteen sixty-four. and continued to Abu Dhabi in 1971, they created a very firm and solid basis for our mutual understanding. And when the official commissions met, they did not contradict any of the findings of the unofficial commission. They simply accepted it because uh, that uh, dialogue and its findings uh, were done by the most eminent theologians available on both in, in both traditions. Uh, well, I had been participating in some of the discussions towards the end of the official uh, dialogue when I was a member of the uh, delegation from the Oriental Orthodox. Uh, I remember vividly the visit of His All Holiness Bartholomew and His Eminence Damascus of Blessed Memory to India in 2000 AD. And the primary objective of their visit to the Malangara Church, the ancient Church of St. Thomas, was to convey us the findings of the official commission uh, and to seek um, uh, proper action from our church. Uh, that was a very successful visit. I still remember 
the enthusiasm of our people in India with which they received uh, His Holiness the Communical Patriarch and His Eminence uh, Damascus. And that was symbolic of the general approach of all our Oriental churches. The people uh, and the enlightened Well, uh, this is a problem, you know. <laughs> uh, um, we we yeah, cannot continue, make any... Continue, continue. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so, uh, well, um, as I said, the dialogue raised a lot of hope in ecumenical circles in the 20th century. Because after 1,500 years, Two great traditions uh, of the divided church came together the, uh, two streams of the divided church came together and they asserted, acknowledged that we held the same apostolic faith. You know. Except for the theological uh, issue raised, raised at the Council of Chalcedon, well, we had complete agreement in theology, in ecclesiology, in pneumatology, uh, in spirituality, in the monastic tradition, uh, in the canons of the councils, which sometimes uh, uh, rejected by both traditions. So the canonical, ecclesiological, and the pneumatological traditions were all the same in the both in both traditions. Uh, I can uh, since I since I have been able to visit and pray with the local churches in the oriental tradition in uh, Egypt, in Syria, in Armenia, in Ethiopia, and also in most of the churches of the Byzantine liturgical tradition. I have personally come to the joyful conclusion that uh, there is at the core of our spiritual life, there is unity uh, of the Holy Spirit. Unity And Professor Marcellus and others present here would definitely agree with me because we have rejoiced at uh, the, 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 the the experience of unity we had. And I see the name of I see the name of uh, uh, Christine Shayo here, and I'm very grateful to her. Uh, this uh, lay lady of the Orthodox tradition, traveling and experiencing a lot of uh, pain uh, uh, 
to uphold the unity of our both traditions. And I had been um, familiar with the activities of the Sindesmos, the youth movement of the Orthodox Church, and how they hope for a reunion of our both traditions. Well, I, uh, in this particular situation, uh, it's difficult to go into any uh, doctrinal discussion, but uh, Professor Martelos has very well done that. I simply express my uh, deep uh, hope As we prepare for that uh, final consummation, I think our fellowship and our mutual conversations uh, and our togetherness, uh, they would bear witness to the unity of the Orthodox tradition in the world. Uh, we, should, we should not be much delayed. I know, I know the, I know the ecclesiastical uh, conflicts and the uh, many other issues involved in it. But at the, at the core of everything, we have the, the, the For all the world, and particularly for India, 1.3 billion people are facing, uh, seriously facing the threat of COVID. Uh, and our churches are very much involved in helping people in whatever way uh, they can help the situation. Let us be together as one body, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father George. And since you mentioned uh, our uh, um, good friend, uh, Christine, uh, she is uh, an author who has spent uh, almost her life uh, in promoting this dialogue between uh, Oriental and Eastern Orthodox churches. And immediately now, I would like to uh, ask her to comment uh, or express uh, uh, her feelings, her vision about uh, our joint effort, uh, and by our, I mean the theologians who are struggling towards implementing a deeper understanding of both sides and promote uh, uh, um, the uh, a common rapprochement, at least. Uh, uh, between the uh, Oriental and Orthodox churches, as you both, uh, Jorgos Marcellus and uh, Father K.M. George, uh, uh, indicated that despite this almost 1,500 uh, years of separation, of uh, Eucharistic separation, we had uh, retained almost the same uh, spirituality, the same as it, is, ha it is, has been... Um, um, at least through the theological dialogue uh, reaffirmed, uh, the same Christology, the same ecclesiology. Uh, and uh, despite this, uh, uh, because of God knows uh, uh, what powers uh, uh, prevent uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, listening to our Lord's uh, uh, demand that we may all be one, we still are in the process. Now, Christine, the floor is yours now to uh, make comment, uh, uh, ask questions, express your vision. And we appreciate once more the, the effort you have been doing all these years. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh -huh. So, Professor, Marcellus and uh, Professor Vasiliadis, dear Father K.M. George in India. I'm so happy that through technology, without taking any plane, we can be together and discuss this topic of the 
uh, dialogue between the so-called Oriental and uh, uh, Oriental Orthodox and Chalcedonian Orthodox churches. As you mentioned, uh, well, I am not a, theologi a theologian. My, I tried to uh, bring my little uh, uh, participation in the dialogue because I belong to the parish of Chambézy, and as you mentioned, Professor Marcellos, it is where the, the, the official dialogue began in 1985 with the late Metropolitan Damaskinos. And uh, so it was beyond my will that I was uh, taken into this interest and with the support, I would say, of the late Metropolitan Damaskinos uh, as, you know, one, I think, important part of the dialogue, one important part, the most important is, of course, the theological dialogue and to discuss about the theological uh, uh, questions, but in every step of the dialogue, there were mentions of the practical dialogue. Can you, well, can you hear me? It's not me. Yes, yes, we can. Okay. We so have families it, also with us. I see. I see. So it is uh, the work which I don't, I would say God gave to me because he, I was uh, it was beyond my, my understanding at the beginning, just to gather the texts of the dialogue uh, with a preface by Metropolitan Damaskinos. And then through my many uh, travels in the Middle East and Ethiopia to um, meet many people of the Oriental Orthodox churches, in the Syrian Orthodox Church, the Armenian Church, the Coptic Church in Egypt, the Ethiopian Church in Ethiopia, and also uh, I visited a few times the Malankara Church in India. And so I can, yes, uh, give the testimony, as Father George said, that on the side of the Oriental Orthodox Churches, uh, people were always very open and positive for this dialogue with the um, Eastern Orthodox churches. In fact, it was mentioned that Patriarch Bartholomew visited India, but he also visited uh, several times Egypt and, uh, and Ethiopia and uh, other countries where Oriental Orthodox uh, faithful are living. And um, he was very welcome in every place and other uh, patriarchs of the uh, Eastern Orthodox churches who visited these um, communities of the Oriental Orthodox churches were always very welcome. So um, I tried to explain as it was mentioned that at the level of spiritual life, of liturgical life, of monastic life, even at the level of, of the veneration of icons, we have many, many things in common. So of course the texts, the prayers are not the same, but the, the message, the, the, the deep meaning of all these texts is similar. So just to, to show you one of my books, it is the only one in Greek about, I don't know if you see it, about the veneration of icons in Greek that was published by N. Plo in Athens. And uh, well, my, my books about um, uh, called Introduction to Life and Spirituality of the Coptic Church, Ethiopian Church, Syrian Orthodox Church, Armenian Church, where and other books about this topic and the dialogue were translated into 11 languages. And it is just to show the effort <laughs> to share with as many people as possible, because as you mentioned, there is a great need for informing all the people and not the, the dialogue must not remain at the level of the patriarchs and of the very uh, uh, honored theologians of the two families of churches, 
But if we want a dialogue to be fruitful and to be true, not to be artificial because it would be only the work of some groups of theologians, we must involve everything because this is what we believe in the Orthodox Church, that we must, we are one body all together in the church. So um, I tried very hard in a book called The Dialogue Between the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox Churches, uh, edited by Volos Academy in Volos some years ago, to um, gather articles and by famous and well-known theologians, among whom uh, Father John McGuckin, the specialist, great specialist of Cyril of Alexandria, Father Andrew Laus, who wrote about Severus of Antioch, Father John Baer also wrote about Severus of Antioch. We had two articles by uh, Professor Marcellus, as he mentioned his book, but that was summarized in English in his article, The Cyrillian Character of the Chalcedonian Definition of Faith. And um, he had uh, another article, Orthodoxy and Heresy of the Anti-Chalcedonians, according to St. John Damascene, seventh century. So I think we have to open up uh, this dialogue also in the patristic, uh, um, at the patristic level, not only uh, uh, in the fifth century at the time of Chalcedon, but of course we have, we must have a, 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 an overall view and analysis. And of course, I'm, I'm the first one to say that all these theological uh, conversations are most important and uh, we should not jump the, the steps. We, we have to be very serious about theology. We have to be very serious about the ecclesiological questions about uh, the, and at, as I said, we have to take into consideration the spirituality, the ecclesiology, the spirituality, the monastic tradition, etc. in all these churches of, of the two families. And I think that we, we, you know, also we had uh, some, um, some articles in the same book uh, edited by Volos Academy. One article by Father John Her Erickson, Anathema, an obstacle to reunion, question mark. And you know well that uh, Father Erickson knows very well these uh, uh, canonical questions, as well as uh, the, our dear, Professor Fidas, a very expert in canonical matters, who wrote um, an article, The Presuppositions for Restoring Ecclesiastical Communion Between the Orthodox Church and the Ancient Oriental Orthodox Churches, Lifting of Anathemas and Competent Ecclesiastical Authority. And I think on the basis of these articles, we solve or we give answers to all the questions which are still raised by some Orthodox who I would say are not very open for the dialogue. And this is why I think um, when people are not informed or not well informed, they have an excuse, I would say, of course, a bad excuse for not being open for this specific bilateral dialogue. But that's when why, we... Christine, that's why we try <laughs> to exploit any um, situation. And that is why we invited you to join the, um, uh, the volume we are uh, publishing about deaconesses with yes. your presentation, because yes. it may be a kairos, keros in Greek, mm -hmm. um, to uh, renew this interest. And before I give the, uh, the, the floor again back to Professor Marcellos yes. to uh, make- uh, uh, No, of course, I don't want first... to, I just have one question. Yeah, yeah, okay, I will, I will uh, give it to you. The only question, what are the next steps, you know? Exactly, to yeah. Inform the people, but most important, you know, to have the people who are responsible for this dialogue, 
because we have uh, people with names and you know these people on our side for the Chalcedonian churches, it is Metropolitan Emmanuel, who is now Metropolitan of Chalcedon. So he cannot be in a better place, I mean, for <laughs> working for the dialogue. If he's too busy, I think that we, we must uh, uh, find somebody who has time, you know, we need people who have enough time to uh, um, be really dedicated now in a serious way for this dialogue. This is Let my opinion. Let us now Professor Marcellos, who yes, is going to respond to your question, to undertake this task uh, to convince um, Metropolitan Emmanuel uh, to carry further. Yorgos, or to now the floor is yours. Not or to find somebody else. I know he's very yeah, Okay, busy. okay. So, and uh, we must have Nikos somebody Dimitriadis, to please, uh, Nikos Dimitriadis, collect the questions from our students after uh, uh, Professor Marcello's uh, intervention, first intervention. Okay, his... we have also one question from the YouTube. After this, uh, I, will, uh, I will forward to Professor Marcello. Uh, I would say that, first of all, uh, an intervention of the ecumenical patriarchate is needed in order to uh, move on uh, a revival of our interest <laughs> uh, regarding the theological dialogue between the two church families. Uh, and in this uh, meeting, we can uh, discuss about the next steps uh, that are uh, uh, necessary for promoting the uh, theological dialogue uh, in order to be, accept, uh, to be accepted by the uh, local ecclesiastical communities. It's a pity that only the ecumenical patriarchate, and uh, I speak uh, from the side of the uh, Greek Orthodoxy, uh, only the ecumenical patriarchate and the Alexandrian, Alexandrian patriarchate have accepted the uh, recommendation agreement on the theological dialogue. Of course, uh, there is the Patriarchate of Romania, the Patriarchate of Andio, but uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, either the uh, two presidents of the co-presidents of the theological dialogue, of the Committee of the Theological Dialogue, uh, all by the vice presidents uh, have to move to uh, the countries uh, with, uh, in order to, to the Orthodox countries, in order uh, to uh, discuss the result of the theological dialogue with the primates of the churches. And the next step is that the primates of uh, the local Orthodox churches have to bring the uh, Christological agreement into the synods, the local synods, and to approve the results of the theological dialogue. Nikos? Yes, uh, we have, before giving the floor to our students that are following the, the discussion, um, I would like to, to forward the question that, that is uh, now online. It's from Dr. Johanna Youssef. Youssef, yeah. And she's asking, what do you think about the Coptic church nowadays? Yeah, comment uh, Whom is that generally. What, what did they get you? What do you say, Professor? 
uh, if if we understood uh, the question is uh, what is now the position of the Coptic Orthodox Church with regard to this dialogue? If I understand understood well uh, the question posed uh, in the YouTube uh, uh, chat room. Uh, the Coptics have uh, uh, signed the Christological agreement and there is no problem from uh, the side of the Coptic church regarding the uh, acceptance of the theological uh, declarations. The students' questions? Nikos, is anyone who is asking any further question? Uh, the time approaching uh, the Eleni, meeting is... Eleni Vahtia is, uh, is online. I will uh, ask her kindly to pose a question directly to Professor Margellos. Okay, thank you, Professor, uh, Mr. Dimitriadis, Mr. Vasiliadis, and uh, Mr. Margellos. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Christine, actually, I heard the great things from her and from uh, Mr. Mazzelos, of course. So I would like to ask that I think that uh, now uh, we need the uh, unity. I think that uh, we need it uh, more than ever these days. So uh, do you think that the ground is prosperous now? Uh, uh, I th now, uh, not today, but, you know, thank you. Yes, uh, given that these churches, the non Macedonian churches, live in an atmosphere and in an environment of uh, Islamic uh, people, uh, this is uh, a good presupposition in order that they uh, seek uh, for uh, this theological and uh, sacramental union, ecclesiastical union. Uh, I was uh, in Cairo 15, or 15 years ago, I think, yes. And from Cairo, I uh, traveled to Alexandria. And in my way, uh, I stopped in the monastery of uh, uh, Saint Bishoya. I met there a very uh, clever and uh, very uh, 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 anyway, I met the, uh, a very clever mom uh, who told me, uh, uh, who asked me what, uh, where uh, uh, I came from. I told him that uh, I come from Greece and I am responsible for the theological dialogue uh, between the Eastern and the Oriental churches. And uh, he was uh, 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 very impressive uh, through my answer and told me that we Orthodox have to make uh, steps in order to fulfill the ecclesiastical communion between our church and the Coptic, at least the Coptic church. Uh, he told me, uh, let's aside what our Bishop Bishoy says about <laughs> the obstacles of the theological dialogue and 
uh, move as far as possible uh, to the uh, ecclesiastical union uh, in order to reach to a full uh, communion and to uh, communicate in the same uh, uh, caliph. Uh, in this uh, uh, perspective, uh, I would say that the, at least the Coptic church is uh, uh, in, uh, on the milieu of uh, the people, is very uh, uh, is preparated to accept the theological dialogue and the uh, results of this dialogue in the framework uh, to achieve full communion. The problem is that ecclesiastical leaders from the both sides have uh, some suspicions, some uh, pastoral uh, uh, negations. Uh, and in this way, we cannot go uh, further with this thing. I think that uh, the theological dialogue uh, between the two church uh, families uh, is in the line of the of Saint John Damascene who had uh, recognized the orthodoxy of the non-Hasidonian, the non-Hasidonians, uh, characterizing them as orthodox. Of course, this orthodoxy is not uh, an ecclesiastical orthodoxy that uh, means that the non-Hasidonians uh, can uh, have a full communion with us. But ideologically speaking, theologically speaking, there is uh, this recognition from the side of an official dogmatic theologian of our church referring to the non-Hasidonians, that they are orthodox in faith. For this reason, St. John Damascene has tried to persuade them to accept the Council of Chalcedon. And of course, all the ecumenical councils after Chalcedon, but uh, the stone, the milestone of uh, the obstacles uh, for the uh, full communion between the two family churches is the Council of Chalcedon. Officially, they have not, uh, until now, eh, they have not accepted the ecumenical Council of Chalcedon. Although they accept the theology of Chalcedon. And this is contradictory. Uh, Professor uh, Marcellos, uh, you have summarized uh, not only the problem of the Oriental Orthodox Church, especially the Coptic, which is the main, uh, let's say, stream of this uh, family, but it is also our, not the Greek, but some of our uh, um, very conservative, very fundamentalist uh, um, Eastern Orthodox who oppose any kind of dialogue. 
However, let me, uh, before uh, closing this uh, meeting, uh, allow me to express my gratitude first to you for your excellent presentation and your responses. Uh, also to Father George, uh, and we uh, assure him that uh, we will be praying for uh, the um, ordeal they are under in uh, his country, in India, not only through the COVID uh, pandemic, but also through the tycoon they are experiencing in uh, uh, Kerala uh, these very days. Uh, also, I thank uh, uh, Christine for her comments. But allow me, I will give you the, uh, but allow me to uh, give a more optimistic, uh, um, an op uh, optimistic perspective. Yes. I was listening to a very important uh, um, presentation by a historian in a series of lectures in the uh, Greek uh, television in the Vuli, saying that uh, the um, acceleration of uh, the uh, um, uh, Islamic religion, which uh, in the next decade will become the first in number religion in the world, uh, overtaking the Christianity, not only the Roman Catholic, but all the Christian uh, uh, families together, this will uh, automatically uh, um, engage the grassroots of the people to, to uh, promote uh, the vision of uh, unity. And then, uh, despite any obstacles, dogmatic, whatever, at least, um, canonical, um, they will come to our mind, they will, I mean, people will come to their mind and the uh, institutional churches will uh, come to a positive outcome to this dialogue, especially the dialogue between Eastern and Oriental Orthodox Church, which is our um, uh, um, uh, theme for today's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Christine, you have to say something before we close. Yeah, it, it is very short, but as you know, I am begging for years for practical steps. And I think that at this moment, it is very important to have a team of people of the different churches, Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian, who are really eager, you know, to have positive steps in the dialogue. And uh, I would just give a few names. I can send you all the details by email, but I know that uh, in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, some two months ago, they were discussing about the dialogue with our Orthodox, Chalcedonian Orthodox churches. This was told to me by Father Daniel Sefe Mikael, who is a close collaborator of the patriarch in Addis Abeba, so that would be for the Ethiopian church. For the Armenian church, I would speak of- uh, No, no, send us, th send this name because yes, we so just, want to give yes, them just to, to, know, to our students. Yes, just to say about um, the, the Armenian bishop in New York, Hildin Kian, I know he's very eager and he can uh, put uh, your group in touch with the uh, Catholics in Armenia, that is uh, for the Armenian church. For the Coptic church, I would say uh, Metropolitan Serapion in California, who has a very good group of young of London. Coptic theologians, but the, the theologians are more in California. For India, we have our dear Father um, K.M. George. George. And uh, for the Syrian Orthodox Church, we could have a contact with Father Roger Akras, who had the doctorate in Paris in the Catholic Institute. He's in charge for his church for uh, the, the, the dialogue with the Catholic, and he could be in charge also for the dialogue with the Chalcedonians. So you see, with five persons' names, 
I try to be very short and practical and pragmatic. We can begin with five or six flowers. We can begin, hopefully, to have a bunch of flowers for the dialogue. Thank you very much for your recommendation. We'll keep it uh, uh, and we will be in touch. Uh, and uh, very much for the... I would like, uh, uh, before I give the floor to our uh, um, let's say moderator, the technician, Professor Dimitriadis. Uh, I would like again to thank you all, especially Father K.M. George, who was struggling to be with us, and he was uh, uh, for some part, uh, although we couldn't uh, uh, see his face uh, um, uh, except in uh, for uh, some moments, and also the present the the main uh, speaker of. Uh, uh, today's uh, event, uh, Father, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Georgios uh, Marcellos. Nikos, do you have anything else to um, say before closing? No, okay. Yeah, um, I don't know, uh, Professor. Um... Should, should we close now? I mean, I don't know, because I see also Cape uh, George is uh, online. Maybe he wants to say a uh, last word. If he can. Yeah. Please. Perhaps he can uh, switch off his camera so that we can hear him. Father George? Okay, let us say Christos Anesti, Christ is risen again. And we follow um, the recommendation by our speaker, Professor Marcellos, by our friend Christine, practical uh, ref uh, recommendations, and also uh, the vision and the hope by Father K.M. George. Uh, to our students, uh, uh, we say uh, goodbye again and uh, we meet uh, on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Bye-bye, everybody, and thank you.